Welcome. Welcome to an afternoon edition of Folks Talking Sports. I'm Chris Gardner, owner of the Houston Round Bar View. And joining me is James Mueller, the sports editor of the Daily Cougar. And James, how are you? You've been you're fighting the flu. He's he's fighting. He's a, he's a trooper. He's going to tough it out. He's feeling a little bit better. How are you, sir? Doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, let's get a, a lovely business note out of the way. Since I can find it. All right, here we go. This show is Sports Talking Sports is sponsored by Five Star Properties, a Dallas based company owned by a UH alum. If you're facing foreclosure or need to sell your house as is for cash, call 972 532 SELL or visit the website at fivestarprops.com. That's F I V E S T. A R P R O P S dot com. First things first, we able to join uh, Saturday's Less Rage Cougs post game show. I was not able to. Well, okay, so let's talk about the the beatdown that the Cougs gave to East Carolina Saturday, ruining the Pirates' senior day. The Cougs won forty two to three. How surprised were you surprised at the performance by the Cougs? I wasn't surprised that UH won. I thought UH would win by maybe a score or two. Um, and the offensive performance didn't surprise me because Clayton Toon's been doing that all throughout the second half of the season. The defense was what was the big kicker because, you know, the past two weeks, teams have been getting whatever they wanted through the air against UH. You know, Mordecai put up ridiculous numbers and then Temple's Warner three for 450 something last week. Um, and so, I thought going into this week, ECU has a veteran quarterback and Holt, uh, Holt Nailers, who has, I think he's the AAC's um, all-time passing leader, um, if I'm correct. I'm pretty sure that's correct. But um, I thought, you know, he'd be, that'd be another challenge for the secondary. And, you know, they've been beaten up, um, still having to play a bunch of young guys. So I thought, again, it would be more of a shootout type deal. Uh, so, yeah, that that surprised me that, ECU was held to just three points in the secondary, uh, you know, never allowed Aylers to get into rhythm. Um, and yeah, I was shocked, James. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I thought it was gonna be a loss for the Cougs because I thought they were losing a shootout. I thought East Carolina would be able to run and pass the ball against Houston's defense. I was wrong, kudos to the defense. But this comment from Joe Mendez, where has that team been all season? Because if that team had played well, the Cougs would not be just seven to four. It'd be better than seven to four, and probably would would not need help to uh, get a spot in the AAC title game like they do right now. So, but kudos to them. Second, I was kind of surprised that East Carolina not the play calling was kind of strange to me. I mean, it's like they didn't watch the game film of previous Houston games and Houston opponents. But that's that's their fault. That's not. Coach Hogerson's fault, the defense's fault, you know. The Cougs took advantage of it and, and they got the win. So that's the bottom line. And and they got a chance to beat Tulsa this week, finish eight and four. Tulsa's not great this year. Um, you know, that should be a win. It's a home game, final home game of the season. It's the Cougs senior day. So uh let's start that right now. Are you predicting a win? And how strong is your prediction, James? <clears throat> yeah, I think they'll win. I'll go ahead and guarantee it. Um all right. Guarantee. And I'm going to make it two times because I guarantee the Cougs will win. Guarantee. And beat Tulsa this week. So eight and four. And then no wait. Uh, we were shocked. I was shocked that Navy beat UCF <laughs> in Orlando on the Golden Knights senior day. So where'd that come from? <laughs> I mean, it was like what 17 14 is kind of low scoring too so yeah. that's navy didn't complete a single pass oh for one <laughs> passing one pass attempt and ran the ball what was it 63 plays i think something <laughs> like that it was ridiculous <laughs> so sometimes old school football still works you know i mean it worked for navy and navy i think in conference they're doing pretty well the record is right around 500 so I'm not sure what that says about the conference overall, that Navy and that style still works. But, hey, 
they surprised the conference, beat UCF on the road, and still opened the door for, for some slim chance for the Cougs to uh, be one of the teams in the title game for the AAC Conference Championship. Uh, Tulane and Cincinnati play this Friday. Friday, yeah. And so that's the loser of that game is out. Uh, right? I I, well, that. I mean, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> the ahead. winner would get home field. The loser would still have a chance. Assuming UCF wins this weekend, I think they play South Florida, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, assuming UCF wins, if uh, Tulane lost to Cincinnati on Friday, I think Tulane would still get in because they beat UCF. Or wait, did they? I can't remember. I know, I know, UCF beat to, uh, since uh, Cincinnati, yeah. So they that that would be a thing. I, I I think it's really hard for the Cougs to get in, um, just because I think even a uh, two loss Cincinnati or two loss UCF in conference play team would get in over a two loss UH uh, team in conference. But we'll see. Um, yeah. So I mean, let's let's go right there. If the Cougs, if our guarantee is correct, Houston beats Tulsa, they're eight and four. They don't, they would not have reached the conference title game. Is this season, would this season be a disappointment? I mean, I think given what they had going into it, yeah. Um, Cause I mean, they were people expected them to make the conference time not only make it but win it um a lot of people had them in new year's six bowls uh going into the season uh and i mean you returned i I, we've talked about you know they've lost some key pieces but every team does you return Mm -hmm. the main guys you need i mean with a quarterback like tune um some key defenders obviously injuries haven't helped um but that's not an excuse of course every team goes through injuries uh has probably been through a little more than a lot of teams but um overall yeah i think final season in the american houston came in wanting to make a statement go out with a bang go out on top and people a lot of people expected them to to or at least be in a position to compete for a conference title and as it's looking it's highly unlikely that they'll even get a chance to play in that championship game um so yeah, I'd say overall, probably disappointing season. Uh, you can definitely take away some positives from the second half of the season because, like we talked about, who knew, we a lot of us expected it to go completely on the off the rails going into Memphis. Um, so the fact, assuming they win Saturday, uh, to be able to get out get eight wins out of it, and um, the offense has looked great over the second half of the season. So there's some positives, but as a whole, yeah, I think. Uh, this wasn't the 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 you know farewell AAC season that uh, UH wanted, and it, it's amazing how that come from behind win in Memphis saved their season, <clears throat> and some might argue possibly saved Dana Hogerson's job because they were teetering. I mean, they were down what thirteen points in the last three minutes of that game at Memphis and came back and won by a point, 33-32. And then they beat Navy, they beat South Florida. That embarrassing performance in Dallas against the Mustangs, giving up 77 points. But then they beat Temple and big win over East Carolina on Saturday, 7-3, 7, you know, in, well, what are they? 8-3, and 7-4. So, 7-4 and, seven and, four. Seven and four overall, uh, and they have – they're five and two in conference. Right. In Tulsa game. Oh, wow. 630 James. That's the, that's going to be Saturday, two days after Thanksgiving. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Home game. Yeah. I'm kind of curious how many people show up for that one. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the basketball game will, I mean, that will, I don't know if we'll get carry over from that, but. They haven't announced that time yet, but I know it will be, you know, probably a 1 or 2 p.m. tip um, for that. Yeah, good call because I think the men's team plays uh, Kent State. Yeah. Earlier Saturday inside Fertitta Center. And I hope the school athletics is wise enough to to tie in promotions between the two games, you know, with the basketball team and the football team. 
football team is senior day. So I'm not sure what they should do, but ticket promotion or tie in, you know, something yeah. to encourage the, the fans who do come to the basketball game to stay and go for the football game. Yeah, so, for sure. Another idea here tossed out on folks talking sports. Let's get into uh, basketball men's team. In uh, oh, in case let everyone know, I'm going to say this. Uh, Andy Yanez, I think, should be arriving by now in Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, for tonight's game. Uh, he'll, he'll be there covering the game as part of Gallery Sports, but also he'll be doing the Less Rage Cougs post game show after the game from Eugene, and he's going to be doing uh, covering few few. I'm not say all, but many of the team's road games now for the rest of this season. So that means less red Cougs will be on the road. James and I, I know we're going to be in Fort Worth as well for the game against St. Mary's. So we're traveling, James, we're, we're, we're expanding. We're, we're on the road with, with uh, technology. We'll still bring you shows and, and things of that sort, but yeah, so look forward. That's why Andy's not with us right now. Willie Gibson is either, either covering the Cavs or the Browns. So he's in Cleveland, in Ohio, doing what he does in his other job. So we moved up today's FTS to three because I'll be heading to uh, downtown for the Rockets Warriors game shortly because that game tips at six. I didn't realize because I've been doing all kinds of stuff that the Warriors are 0 and 8 on the road. Yeah. Did you, until yesterday, I did not realize that. So I ask you, James Mueller, Joe Mendez, folks tuning in. Oh, got to do better a job of this, promoting it. Will the Warriors still be winless on the road after tonight's game against the Rockets? No. No. I, and you were quick about that too, James. <laughs> I mean, no hesitation whatsoever. So you're saying Golden State will get their first road win tonight. Yeah. I mean, I just don't have much faith in this Rockets team, what they've shown. Why not? What what have you seen that gives you pause or concern or or any of those things? I mean, it's just they haven't taken that jump on under Silas that a lot of people thought. Um, there's still a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, I mean, they they they've got they play well in flashes, um, and they've obviously got a lot of talent. Um, Jabari's been off to a slower start than I thought he'd get off to this season. Um, obviously, he, I mean, he's a rookie, um, so there's obviously that learning curve there, and you can't expect him to, you know, come into the league as an all-star. But overall, I think just, yeah, I mean, it, it's just been a lot of inconsistencies. You'll get, you know, spurts of good play, but they haven't been able to put together many complete games. Um and some of the coaching decisions just have not made a ton of sense. Like what? You you sound like some of the people who tune in to uh, the Let's Talk Houston Rockets show here on the Houston Round Bar Review channel. What what coaching decisions have have you questioned when you watch Rockets? I mean, one is just with Shingoon. I think they haven't played him in, or at least in the terms of sometimes. I feel like he should be out there on the floor more just with what he's been able to do, um, mix and match a little more. Uh, late game decisions. Um, I forget what game it was, but there was a one game close. You know, they went to Eric Gordon twice in a row, um, turned the ball over, uh, lost that. Just just things like that, I feel like j they. it's just not what I would do. Understood. You're not alone in your assessment and your opinion on that. I, I'm getting it. Um, I got a I guess I full uh, last night on the show from rocket fans. And they told me that I did not realize, but there is a fire Steven Silas petition going around. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll see how, how much I know where it is in terms of signatures, anything like that. But I have been told it's in the last 10 days or so that coach Silas does need to win some games and win some games soon. Mm -hmm. So make, make, of that what you will <clears throat> if he does not win game soon he may not be the head coach of the rockets much longer no timetable on how soon that would be but he needs to win games soon 
And this next seven game stretch they have starting tonight with the Warriors and then the Hawks, OKC, who's who surprised folks so far, two in Denver, and then Phoenix at Phoenix at Golden State. James, right there. If I, okay, top of your head, Warriors tonight. Rockets win, lose. Loss. Hawks on Friday, home game against the Hawks. Win or lose? Loss. Home against OKC on Saturday. Win. At Denver Monday and Wednesday next week. Two losses. At Phoenix on Friday. Loss. And then at the Warriors. Loss. So that's one and six. One and six, yeah. Okay. Joe Joe keeps talking about Marcus Jones to the house. Did he just take one back to win for the Patriots? So yeah, Joe, keep typing it up. What what did Marcus Jones do? The kickout return, pick six. What was it that he did that uh, makes me as a Cougar alum? Eighty-four yard touchdown punt return. Oh, there we go. Well, that's crazy. He's got he's the been, neck. He's been close to breaking a few. Um, so good for him. I'm not a fan of the Patriots, but you know, once a Coug, always a Coug. So that's good. And more, more and more, once the sale ever happens and it's official, I'll we'll return to being a fan of the Washington Commanders. But I do know that they beat the Woeful Texans today, 23 yeah. to 10. And that postgame show will be on the Houston Rombard Review channel around, I think, six or seven this evening. So tune in for that on the Ad Max Corner. But yeah, the Patriots won 10 to 3. And that touchdown was courtesy of Marcus Jones. So how about that? So Joe, thank you very much for, for letting us know and hipping us to that. Cougs men's basketball. Third rank Cougs face Oregon tonight on ESPN, 8 30 p.m. Central Time. Cougs are, I think I saw favored by six and a half. What do you say, James? Who's win tonight? Remain yeah. undefeated, move the number two in the country. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think they win. I think they'll cover um, for sure. Uh, Oregon's looked a little shaky, honestly. I wouldn't be surprised if they. I, I mean, for sure. I think for sure, number two. I wouldn't be surprised if they jumped up to number one. North Carolina has not looked. I mean, they just haven't been convincing. They they're undefeated, but um, right with the with if you looked at their schedule before the season you'd think they'd be dominating and um it just hasn't been that way so we'll see but um yeah i do think uh wins tonight yeah the tar heels are now four and oh and i think today's win over james madison might have been the most impressive they beat unt wilmington by 13 that was kind of a struggle a little bit charleston they were 86 to charleston but won by 16. gardner webb was much closer than a lot of folks thought it was a six-point game. And then the Tarios won today for JMU, 80-64. <clears throat> so I think it's outside chance, Cougs win. But we talk about that. Oregon lost to UC Irvine last week at home. And that does make sense. <laughs> you know, Oregon. But it happened. So Oregon's wins. I mean, they are two and one on the season. The loss to Irvine was by 13. I think I said 11 on the Les Red Cougs show. 69-56. And then they followed up. They bounced back, beating Montana State 81-51. So Oregon's wins are over Florida A&M and Montana State. Their one loss is to UC Irvine. Well, I think you and I both agree that the Cougs are better than Florida A&M. UC Irvine and Montana State. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. what are, what's been your thought of, the, of uh, what you've seen from the Cougs so far in uh, these first four games? I mean, obviously, the record's not surprising. Um, they've been dominant. There hasn't really been many stretches where they've been outplayed or anything like that. It's been impressive. I think uh, Jarris Walker's shown. You know, I mean, he's sort of been what I expected so far. He's had a few games where he's been, you know, the best player out there offensively. Other games where he struggled, but, you know, made an impact on the boards with his defense. Um, Marcus Sasser's 
been Marcus Sasser. Uh, Tremont Mark had a really nice game um, against Oral Roberts. He's still coming along. Um, and then while Jamal Shedd hasn't been, uh, you know, scoring a ton, he's been a nice orchestrator out there. And then I think one of my biggest things has been just the play of uh, – JVA Francis off the bench. I think he's shown some really nice things um, coming into the season. I didn't know how much they'd use him. I figured he'd get in some. I didn't think I didn't think he'd be as big of a part of the rotation as he's been in there so far. And I think um, he's shown some nice things and give him um, some nice spurts. And you know is able to. I think he'll play a big role coming down the stretch. Um, he's going to continue to develop and get better. So yeah, that that would probably be my biggest takeaway just in terms of players but overall i mean it's what you expect from a kelvin sampson team they don't i mean given the quality of their opponents haven't been great but uh i mean oral roberts is a good offensive team and they they couldn't do anything um i mean it's just been a defensive clinic and then uh i mean uh is scoring at, at will so i mean it's been it's been a strong uh start and they're showing that um depth um and showing people why they're i think they're currently still the betting favorites to win the Natty um, as of now. Um, I know they were earlier in the week because uh, they put that on the when I was out sick uh, on the ESPN Plus broadcast against Oral Roberts. I think hmm. I didn't. I didn't know that. That's not a surprise. Um, but the Oral Roberts game, Oral Roberts is is a guard. I mean, they got a seven foot five corner Vanover. He did okay in that game. But Max Asmus, one of the top scorers two years ago in the country, struggled. Three points, right? Is this I that think three points, yeah. yeah. Uh, the team at Old Roberts for the game was 14 for 62. Seven for 31 each half. They struggled to make threes. And if you struggle to make threes against Houston, you're going to struggle to win. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, the Ducks, look at the stat line. They're only shooting 56% as a team from the free throw line, 44.6 from the floor, 30% from three. So they're not a good three point shooting team. So that's, if you can't make shots from the outside against Houston, you're going to struggle. Uh, last I saw yesterday, Doug's big man and Folly Dante, 14 and eight on the season so far, was slated to, slated to play today. If he doesn't, going to be even more difficult for Oregon to beat the Cougs. But a guy that I've been surprised with so far for Houston is Dewan Roberts. Oh, yeah. His, his, they're looking to him to score on the block. You, you can see the develop. He's another example of the Houston Cougars coaching staff and their player development. Mm -hmm. Another su success story. Um, Dewan is scoring on the block, left side and right side. Some mid-range game, we've seen it. He hasn't really displayed it in games yet because it has been needed. He's been working on his three-point shooting. Yeah. He's, he, so he's becoming better at that as well. So just another example of Houston and player development. And let's talk about that. Um, it was announced when Wednesday, I think the last day of the first week of fall signing period, that big man – and big man Cedric Lott, 6'9, 6'10, 250. In one interview, I think he said, said last month that Coach Bishop weighed him at 261. He didn't think he was that heavy, <laughs> but you get an idea. He's about 6'10, 250, but he's 18 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, he's only started been playing basketball for three years. So he's very raw, but the potential is there. And if you have not seen clips of him and highlights of him, he dunks the basketball like the rim pissed him off. I mean, <laughs> he dunks like Shaq. I mean, just with true ferocity. So that's his strength right now is, is slam dunks, and he's better on defense. But overall, I think he'll be a good example, a good indicator of player development so have you had a chance to do any digging on on, on Cedric a lot his game but he's going to be coming reporting to houston in january to get an early start in the culture and working out with coach bishop 
and he's a national signing. So you got uh, Jacob McFarland from California, Cedric, really based in, in the Utah area because BYU is one of his final schools as well. But what have you found out or learned about big man Cedric Lott? Yeah, um, one thing when I've seen – when I watched his highlights was the dunking, obviously I, I was going to say, it looks like the, you're afraid the rim's going to fall off every yeah. time, you know, cause um, I, and I've, I've, I've been told, excuse me, James, I've been told he's broken three rims. That wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah uh, they might need to get some insurance policy at Fertitta Center or something, but um, yeah. Um, overall, that was one thing you mentioned earlier too, about he'd only been playing for three years. Kelvin mentioned that on the zoom. I did not know that. So um, you know, looking back at that in perspective, once Kelvin said that and, you know, going back and watching some stuff, it's impressive what he's been able to do. Um, obviously, there's a long way. He's still young. High schooler got a lot of ways to go. Um, but like you said, him coming in in January is going to be huge. Um, just 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 to get an early taste of what it's like um, mm -hmm. and, you know, get to spend some time behind some really good bigs. And, you know, Jarris will be well into his freshman year you got Jawan and reggie who are leaders jva is going to continue to develop so i mean there's just a lot of people he can learn from there um so i think that will be huge for him and uh he, he's probably one of those guys who takes a couple of years before he sees a few a significant playing time if i had to guess but i think uh overall you know in two three years you're going to be talking about a really good elite big man um that samson brought in so yeah there i think uh i mean i'm pretty high on him in terms of just potential uh and you know going into a staff like houston's there's not many better that have proven to been able to develop guys so i think it's a great situation and one thing uh, coach samson mentioned in our zoom call i think andy asked him the question to for more info on, on cedric yeah, Coach Sampson said that uh, when he was talked to Cedric, that and his and his people, his circle, choose a school. And this is when Cedric made his visit, you know, in our recruiting process. Choose a school that will develop you. Choose a staff, you know, choose a coaching staff that will develop you. Don't just choose a school because they sent X amount of guys to the NBA or or anything like that. What if they, you know, but choose a staff that will help make you a better player. Well, the Houston Cougars staff has shown that they will help make their players better. So he'll get here in January when fans watch the games and you see this large young man in UH warm-up gear or whatever, that's going to be Cedric a lot, you know. And if you – why is he playing? Because he's not, he's not going to play yet, okay? He's here <laughs> – to get in shape, learn the culture. He will be able to practice with the team because that's what Emmanuel Sharp did. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel got here in January and he spent time learning the culture. He did travel with the team on the road. So I think that'll be the same for Cedric. That'll be a great a plus for Cedric as well to go on the road with the team and learn the ropes, get a, a sense of college basketball and not have to worry about the stress of playing early. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a benefit. And then you got in Jacob McFarland. Jacob told me he's going to get here in June. And I think I haven't talked to Cordell Jefferson, but Jojo, you know, Jojo's in town. So I think he'll report in June as well. Cordell probably also. So a Houston kid, a Texas kid, and then, then two kids from, from national. So it's a good look for the program. And let's touch on it <clears throat> for folks wondering. Coach Sampson said that the staff is done signing high school players for the class of 23. Okay. Mm -hmm. That does not mean they're done. They're, they're just done signing high school players. So what does that tell you, James Mueller? I mean, like, like any, all, everyone in college basketball, you're going to be looking in the portal, um, come in, into, uh, you know, late in the year. Um, because you're always looking – I mean, Kelvin's talked about it a lot, but it's the veteran teams that win, and they've done a good job adding guys through the portal um, over the years. Last year, you know, you saw that with Tajay, Josh, 
Kyler. Um, they, they continue to get guys, so they they'll be looking for some guys to uh, that can come sort of be plugged in immediately. Because I mean, not looking too far ahead, but you know, Marcus will probably will be gone. Jarris will probably be gone. There'll there'll be some holes that they need to fill. And not saying nothing against the freshmen they got coming in, but um, you know, Samson likes those veteran, experienced guys. And I, I, based on on that the position that seems to be needed to fill or, or back up for to depth purposes will be point guard. Mm-hmm. So for someone back up Jamal shed, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I don't, I doubt it will be difficult for the, the staff to get a veteran point guard to want to join this program and join the Cougs and be a part of the big 12 and, and success and, and, and all that. So I don't think that's going to be a tough task. You know, they'll, they'll evaluate, as Coach Sampson told us, about the, who's best fit for the backup spot and then pare down their list and go from there. And, and then once that person comes on campus, it didn't take long for that person to commit and then just keep it moving. You know, that's one thing I think we've learned in covering coach Sampson over the years is he has a plan and he sticks to his plan. So Mm -hmm. I, I I don't spend a lot of time on, I don't know how much time you spend on the recruiting part of it, of, of who the Cougs bring in for, or who they're looking at or, or, you know, cause fans are real hyped about, well, so-and-so has Houston on his final five or, or, or this, and he's, or, or what are they doing? Chris, what, how come I hear more about who they're looking at for, for, for positions or, or point guard or, and I'm just like, trust Coach Sampson. He knows what he needs. He'll get, he'll, he'll get it done. So I'm at that point, and I mm-hmm. contrast that with, I don't have that confidence in Coach Hogerson. So you tell me how you feel about that. I mean, I think. I mean, football is a little different, but in terms of just, you know, it, it will be really interesting. This this past year, they were able to bring in some nice guys. No, no you know, names that just like blew you away. But um, now that, you know, they, they've been able to use the Big 12 with that. So going into this Big 12, uh, that should be a help for uh, Coach Holgerson. But I would, I do not think the UH football team or program is at any point near where the men's basketball program is where kids are going out of their way to come to Houston like it's at the top of the list um I think in football there'd be a lot of big 12 teams if they got an offer from to transfer in that would be ahead of UH um just based on uh track record and the fact that I mean Houston's never been in the big 12 before and there's some other teams there you know oklahoma state kansas state that have proven that they can win and so uh kids want to go play for winners and not not to say houston's not going to win in the big 12 i don't know but um there's there's a lot more questions in terms of um the direction and just especially given some of the struggles that they've had this year in the american i I haven't checked i don't know if you if you had time to look into it i'm not even sure i'm sure somebody's done it but where Houston football ranks in terms of recruiting class for the new Big 12. I, I guess I phrase it like that. Because I don't know if they're bottom four or, or, or mid four or whatever. I don't know about that. So that's something to inquire yeah. about because they got to get better talent if they want to be competitive in the Big 12. So they're 65th overall nationally, uh, okay. big, big 12 wise. I'm trying to see, uh, let's see here. I don't, it's hard to sort them because yeah, I, so yeah, they won't the put them in the big 12 right now since right. they're technically not in it. Um, but I would imagine, yes, it's towards the bottom, at least bottom third. So, and that has to get better and it might, it, it just has to get better, but off right now, Projecting. Let's do some projecting with, with Joe and anybody else watching us on YouTube or on Folk Talk Sports on Twitter. Who would you say Houston football is better than in the new Big 12 as of July 1st, 2023? 
I think they could beat West Virginia. Um, uh, uh, I agree. I lean more toward that as a yes than I was a while ago, but okay, yes. I think they're up there with Kansas. Uh, Kansas has sort of teetered off. They've started off really hot. This, this is still like isn't the same Kansas that have been, you know, just getting steamrolled by everyone. Um, but I think even though UH lost to Kansas this year, I think they'll be at least competitive with them. Um, and then, I mean, Iowa State's record's not good, but I, I can't remember. They've lost six or seven one-score games. Um, mm -hmm. So they're right in there with, you know, their, their season could look completely different. Um, but the only one I would say with confidence that I would take UH over in the current Big 12 would be West Virginia, um, probably. And then I'd say maybe Kansas. But other than that... Um, that's so yeah that's that's the bottom of the conference james you know yeah. that's that's not that's not good enough um and we'll see about expectations what's for the program once everything is official and it sounded like last week coach hogerson was trying to already tamp down expectations for next year uh which kind of surprised me and dayon and a lot of folks already he's, he's trying to tamp down the expectations because of new quarterback. The running game should be strong next year for the Cougs in the first year of the Big 12. Everything else, offensively, I think they should be okay. Quarterback. Quarterback's the big thing. Is, is a big question. And Lucas. then defense, talent-wise, I'm just not sure they match up well with, with the Big 12 overall. Not, not just experience, talent defensively. So that's an area to, to fix. Um uh, with the way some of these teams in the Big 12 air it out, uh, if, yeah, I mean it could be it could be a long. So in a, and that's they got to address because that's one thing. Get back to the game against East Carolina. Prior to Saturday's game, we've you know you watched the Cougs defense this year. There were so many times where wide receivers and tight ends for, for opponents were just wide open all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, all the time. That was not the case yesterday. I'm not sure. Part of it, I think, was improvement on defense, even though I did see the Cougs miss a lot of tackles still. Um, but the play calling, ECU did not go to the tight end enough. I'm not sure that because of the scheme, if they have a, a good pass catching tight end. But their game plan just was kind of strange against the Cougs. But 42 to 3 speaks, speaks volumes for Houston and they got the win. Do you think it it quiets any any more or any talk of, of Dana Hogerson being gone this season? That, that's over. That talk is dead. I, st I don't I still stand by even, you know, earlier in the season when they were uh, what, two and three. I, I, I just don't think I don't think he was going to go anywhere just with the terms of the buyout and stuff. I think this definitely um, I know in the, the Houston Chronicle reported that, you know, he'd be good as long as they showed improvement and didn't completely lose the team. I mean, it seems like I mean, they've shown improvement, obviously. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done and he hasn't lost the team. So I think I think, yeah, um, he'll, he'll, he'll get I mean, he's done. He'll he'll be back next year. That that's all I'll say. Um, yeah. Do you think the entire staff will be back? Uh, we'll see about that. It will be interesting. Um, I'd be surprised if. I mean, I know. Offensively, I mean, especially early in the year, the play calling was sort of questionable. They've been able to turn that around a little. So I'd be surprised if they did anything there, and then. Even though the defense has struggled, you know, they just gave Belk an extension. Um, it, he, he's a young guy who's been able to connect with the kids pretty well. So I doubt um, unless I doubt they make any major changes unless like Houston staff leaves to take other jobs. I don't think uh, there will be a lot of, you know, firings and look, looking at on the outside um, to fill holes. Let me ask you. What has been the difference with the play calling? Has Coach Hogerson taken over more duties or has Coach Dawson seen the light? Because 
yesterday he went to Christian Trahan a lot, the yeah. tight end, and that's been more trains been more involved last few games. And what's what's been different? They're much more aggressive in play calling than they were the first three, four games of the season. Yeah. I don't I'm not hundred percent sure. I'm pretty sure Dawson's still calling plays. At least that's what Dana seen. I could be wrong, but um Dana hasn't said otherwise since he was asked about it. Um I forget when, like four or five games into the season. I think one thing, Clayton Toon, uh, coming off the bye week, one thing he told the media was, you know, he wanted to throw the ball more. He wanted them to be more aggressive. So I think part of that's just probably the senior quarterback getting in that room with Dana, Dawson, guys like that, and being like, you know, we, I, I want to throw the ball more. Let's let's take some shots. We haven't been able to – I mean, not much has worked in the first half right. anyway. Might as well – uh do some, try some new stuff. And like you said, it's worked out. They've, um, you know, they've been much more efficient, um, especially through the air. And then, like you said, they've gotten some of their bigger weapons involved, you know, where Trahan, while he was battling some injuries, he was n not involved at, like, I mean, it, it was like they forgot about him for yeah. the first five, six games. And then, you know, yesterday he, he had his best game in terms of receiving, receiving wise, and he was targeted a lot. And now he's, he, you know, the latter half of the season as a whole, he's been back to that, you know, old reliable guy that Tune goes to, um, to pick up key plays. And um, yeah, he's actually involved in the offense. So I, I can't answer like the play calling thing because I don't know that, but I think a lot of it has to do probably with Tune going in and being like, you know, well, good for me, Tune. Yeah. Me and the veteran, the senior, it was needed and it's worked out well. Question from Joe Mendez Do you believe this? Will Cola be ready for the Big 12? if he's named the starter or do you think the Cougs will hit the portal for a, a veteran QB? Uh, Holgerson likes Lucas a lot. I know that. Um, and he was at Arkansas, obviously didn't play much, but um, I think it's hard to say a QB who's never taken really meaningful snaps to throw him in there and say, yes, immediately they'll be in the big 12 or be ready for the big 12. Um, I do think as of now, it's looking likely that he'll probably be the guy. Um, if I had to guess, uh, just based on they haven't brought in any huge quarterback recruit out of high school, I'm sure they'll probably entertain things in the portal. But I think, you know, a lot of the plan was when bringing him um, in over the past year, you know, get him a year behind tune, get him to learn the system and stuff. And then, once once uh goes into the big 12 he's the guy they roll with but um i mean i think you'll see early season struggles and stuff from him because i mean any quarterback you know playing their first meaningful snaps in college but um yeah i as of now if i had to guess he'd be the guy um unless they do bring in somebody um but that's a little ways away so and and i think whether it's lucas or another quarterback they're going to run more. They should run more because running oh, yeah. back course is deep and talented. Mm -hmm. Alt Alton back. So they might help rest their defense by just pounding the rock and <laughs> just, just running the ball a lot more. And that might help Lucas Coley uh, get comfortable or quarterback X get comfortable face the Big 12. Well, let's get into this. July 1st, 2023, what, it's official, Houston's in the Big 12, what can, what should Houston Athletics do to market, improve marketing, promotion for football in the Big 12? I mean, okay, um, one thing is just, I know we, we went talked about it last year but they don't really have a traditional spring game and they don't advertise it well even though it's free um and this would be before they join the big 12 officially before mm -hmm. that um but i mean first chance to see your cougs as they enter the big 12 make a big deal about that you don't have to run a full-on official game if Holgerson, i know Holgerson doesn't like that but at least do some sort of thing to give um fans an opportunity to see things um and let people know don't just you know put it on your website and no signs nothing like that like right. that's one thing 
uh, another thing, uh, just sort of like you could have like an open house type deal at TDECU Stadium, you know, walk around, look around. Here's all I, I know teams have done this in the past. They'll put like white pieces of paper on every seat that's available for season tickets and stuff. Here's what's available. You can you can check out the view. You can sit in this seat and see if this is a view you'd like. Um, stuff like that. Um, and then we've talked about, you know, the social media. They've obviously taken a step up um, and kudos to them for that. Uh, but continuing to improve that because that exposure is huge. Um, and not only for the fan base, but getting potential recruits to notice you and things like that. So I think continuing to, you know, um, play around with different ideas um, and over the summer, what they, I mean, the, at near the end, they did a better job, but, you know, even when nothing's happening, you know, May, June, July, August, do some fun mic'd up spring sure. practice, summer workout videos, do j just something to give fans some content and obviously do what a lot of teams have done with the countdown, you know, 12 Saturdays till Cougar football is back. Um, 11 Saturdays till mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not much, but I mean, you're just letting people know. And it's a start. You, you, it's yeah. Than nothing. yeah. Joe Mendez, you're, you're, you're giving us comments, helping us through this show, additional folks talk of sports. Anything you'd like to see Houston Athletics do uh, to connect fans with the football program? Because they, they got to do better. They have to do co commercials as well. And commercials to reach more outlets rather than just the same old tired outlets that they've been doing in the past. It's a different era, different time. It's 2000, be 2023 soon. Go where your fans are. They need to, for UH baseball, have flyers handed out at Minute Maid. Um, start, you got to let folks know you're in the Big 12 with baseball as well. Football. Spring games, whatever you can to let people know that Houston football for the city, that's a basketball tag, but for football, is joining the Big 12, is in, is in the Big 12, is in the city of Houston, is about to join another level of college athletics, promotions all over the place. There needs to be whoever, the, if it's Alta McCaskill, whoever this marquee player is next year for football, billboards. You know, I mean, just any ways to promote that player, promote the team starting once the bowl game ends. So some point in January, February, whatever. Hell, start a countdown until July 1st, 2023. When Houston Athletics joins the Big 12. Let people know. I mean, take advantage of this time. Let's be honest. Before the Astros start, take advantage of the Texans stinking. The Rockets stinking. Take advantage of this, this void in of Houston sports. You know, piggyback off men's basketball. Let people know that the Big 12 is coming. Tony M, why are you laughing, Tony? Give us some ideas to promote and reconnect the U.S. football alums. Marcus Jones, come back and, you know, during the offseason. Do some commercials. Hey, UH fans, are you hyped? I'm hyped. We're about to join the Big 12 and blah, 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 blah. You know, things like that. We're giving you these ideas. And James and I and Andy and Will, we feel pretty confident that, that some folks, some UH athletics do watch our show. <laughs> just just going to put that out there. But they have to do something to get the word out, to make people feel a part of the program, and to help bridge the gap and to help avoid this part of the fans coming to see the opponents play give people reason to come see the Cougs play so they gotta you know I, I it's my tried and true thing because if we don't do it who the hell will <laughs> okay so they gotta start doing that promotion promote Come on this show. Come on GoCougs.com. Come on a Paul Sama Jamma. Go on all these different shows that have internet contact with fans and reach out to them to promote your programs, pr promote your coaches, promote your players, advertise, all these different things 
because Big 12 is no joke. That's a bigger level of athletics. And if you don't do a better job of promotion, you will continue getting what you get. So, you know, hype videos, all of it. A little bit helps because it's not enough right now. Zach, winning is, winning is, a, is a start, yes. But that's during the season. We're trying to get interest up during the offseason for the program, for fo football especially because football makes – is a moneymaker. But the irony is, James, I think you agree, football is a moneymaker, but UH does a really poor job of marketing football. If it's the money maker, I mean, so if it's the money maker, then you do a better job promoting it, right? Yeah, of course, and um, yeah, like you said, there. So that I mean, that's yeah. what they got to do. So we're giving ideas, and and the season, this season's almost over. They have a great chance to finish eight to four, and they're going to go to a bowl. How often did you see promotions? Hyping up, it's not a big deal, but it's still a win over an SEC team. The Birmingham Bowl win. I mean, not. I know they had some shirts and stuff on the campus store, and they did. Uh, they were at Toyota Center for something um, for at like a, a timeout of a Rockets game. But other than that, uh, yeah, it's not, not enough. This is a great statement right here from from Joe. Everybody loves winner but they have to know the winner well put so it's on houston athletics to do a better job of telling the city who they are winning is a, is great but winning is during the season what are you going to do in the off season to connect fans to your program that's one thing houston has to do a better job of and i'm not just hell that's everybody in town rice HCU, TSU as well. Everybody got to do a better job during the offseason to let folks know you exist. So that's one thing for all the schools and programs to work on. Um, going to touch on this a little bit. Basketball-wise, UH women fell to one and three yesterday, lost in overtime to Florida State. I was surprised that the game was competitive as competitive as it was kudos to the cougars and coach Huey for making it competitive taking it to overtime james they had 55 layups how many have you seen the stat i have not seen this stat. i just saw the box score and stuff. How, how many do you think they made out of 55 layups 13 that's that's, that's real low <laughs> but you get the idea 24 24 out of 55 layups they lost by six and, and then they then they missed seven free throws. So they they had 93 shots, made 31 of them, and lost by six. So they're one and three. They head to Florida this week for a Thanksgiving tournament. They play Portland on Thanksgiving. Game's gonna be on flow hoops. And they play Portland Thursday, then Florida on Saturday. I got to say right now, the best women's basketball college team is Rice. Second-year head coach, Lindsey Edmonds, they're, they're 4-0 already. I think they're more talented. I got to say it. They're more talented than Houston from top to bottom. Uh, and those two teams will face off on December 10th, Saturday, at Rice. Same time, same tip time as UH men versus Alabama. Who scheduled that? I mean, who? <laughs> Come on, whoever arranged that, y'all couldn't put that game, the Rice women, Rice UH game, at seven o'clock in the evening. But I, I digress. But just a recap of things: UH men tonight in Oregon versus the Ducks, eight thirty p.m. on ESPN. Andy Yanez, our colleague, should be there by now. He's going to uh, report for Gallery Sports, and then do his Less Rage Cougs show post-game show after the game tonight. So on the road with Andy Yanez. Uh, uh, James, I think you can answer this question from Leonard Maddox. I don't think it's certain yet who the next quarterback will be next year for starting quarterback for UH. Yeah, I mean, I'd guess Lucas Cauley right now, but um, like I said, a lot could happen over the offseason. Some 
injuries. They could bring in someone. Who knows? In, in a, as a backup, because I want to do a quick recap and, or preview a discussion of the other teams in town. But this question. How do you sell Hogerson? And and I get Tony's where he's going with it because it, it does not seem and you you cover the football team, I don't. I cover the basketball team. It doesn't seem like Dana cares, or it's just not a big deal to him, the promotion part of it, the marketing part of it. Am I reading that right? So you tell me. I mean, I don't know exactly what his interaction with fans are. It's not as much as where Ke- Kelvin is, not nearly, at, at least from what I've seen. Most of the time, I think his biggest interaction is just the Thursday night radio shows he does at Little Woodrose. Um, but, I mean, that's just sort of, you know, most coaches have some sort of either TV or radio, some show that they got to do. Um, Kelvin has one as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know exactly how far or how much he's involved in stuff like that, but uh, certainly you don't see him out there as much as um, other coaches at UH. And that I think we could say that's not really his job. It's it's the marketing department's job. It's the athletic department's job to promote UH football. He could help, but overall the program has to do a better job promoting UH football. So that's important. Uh, we got some recaps, the final scores here. TSU men lost at Samford today, 78-63. That kind of surprised me. Prairie View men are leading UT Martin. Prairie View men are undefeated right now. They came off beating Washington State a few days ago. So PV is winning on the road against UT Martin. Texas A&M women are struggling against the winless TSU Lady Tigers. They're finally up by 10 late in the fourth quarter. But, yeah, I don't know what that says about the Aggies. If you struggle against TSU, because TSU is not good. <laughs> Teach women. They're not good. This brand-new team, new coaching staff, not much talent, very young well, very young talent. So I'm not sure what that says about the Aggies. But uh, tomorrow, um, the HCU men and Rice men are going to play at Rice Tudor Fieldhouse in a game for the, uh, the Darius Lee Memorial Classic. It's part of the Rice Salt Invitational, but tomorrow's matchup will be a tribute to honor Darius Lee, HCU's player, best player, but that's not the issue. HCU player who was killed in New York when he went to visit this summer, visiting friends and family in New York and was shot and killed. I think Darius was 21, 22 years old. Um, so it's tragedy. So tomorrow's game, is a memorial for him, memorial tribute to him. His family will be there. Some of his family will be the game. I'm going to be there tomorrow as well. So my respect and support for the family. Games at 7 o'clock at Tudor Fieldhouse. I think it's also going to be on Commerce USA TV. I've got a link to it on my website at HoustonRombardView.com. So, but uh, kudos to Coach Wright Styles, Coach Scott Perra for making that happen, having the Jerry Slee Memorial Classic the Owls reached out to HCU head coach Ron Cottrell to get that done. So if you have time, they'll want to check out some good basketball talent level right there between Rice and HCU. It's fairly even. Rice is still a little bit better than the Huskies, but come by Rice tomorrow to see that game, 7 p.m. tip off. Uh, let's see, Rice women play TSU on Wednesday at 2 o'clock at TSU. And I said earlier, UH women will be in Florida the St. Pete Classic on Thursday and Saturday. The Cougs men's team after tonight's game will not will be off until Saturday and 26 against Kent State at home. Same day the football team winds up their season against Tulsa. So a lot going on in town. Rockets after tonight are off till Friday. So a lot going on. James, you, you should hop on the night after uh, the Cougs Ducks game and join us on Let's Rage Cougs. To we think, uh, well, we're guaranteeing a win, right? I'll go ahead and guarantee it. Yeah. I think Joe and everybody, we're, we're going to guarantee the guarantee that the Houston Cougars third ranked team will remain undefeated and defeat the Ducks this evening. The game is on ESPN. It'll be after the Kentucky Wildcats and Zaga Bulldogs game. That game's at 630. <laughs> so technically, 
the Cougs basketball team part of a double hitter. Yeah. With the lead in with the Kentucky and Gonzaga. That's pretty impressive right there, man. Mm-hmm. It's a pity the Ducks didn't do their part and be ranked. But anyway, <clears throat> my man, how can folks find you, follow you? Give me a chance so I can pull it up here as we but as we close it up the show, this edition of Folks Talking Sports, how can folks find James Mueller on social media? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at JDM2186. And then um, the dailyhuger.com will have all my coverage regarding UH athletics. Thank you as always, man. I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, keep Thanks taking care of yourself. Uh, let's see. I'm KG Chris Gardner of the Houston Round Bar Review. Once again, thanks very much to Five Star Properties, owner of Five Star Properties. He is a Houston alum based in Dallas. So Coogs helping Coogs. Five Star Properties sponsors is a proud sponsor of Folks Talking Sports. So you can see the number on the screen for those listening to the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, and Apple. Number is 972-532-SELL. 972-532-7355. The website is fivestarprops.com, F-I-V-E-S-T-A-R-P-R-O-P-S.com. Five Star Properties will be sponsoring Folks Talking Sports throughout college basketball season. So if you want to be a sponsor after this season ends, just reach out to me and we'll make that happen. Thank you very much for joining us during a, a different time of FTS had three o'clock start today instead of the usual six on Sundays because I'll be at the Rockets Warriors game later on and he's on the road with the basketball team. James decided to was able to join me earlier with a gift covering the Browns or the Cavs in Ohio. So that's why it was the two of us today. I got some ideas for future guests in future shows that may have a UH slant in so let's look for that. Keep watching us on the Houston Round Bar Review on YouTube, as well as on FTS, Folks Talk Sports Twitter account. Thank you once more time. Oh, wow. Just see that uh, number one, number two in women's basketball, South Carolina, Stanford are going to overtime. So that game lived up to the hype. That's great to see. So James Mueller, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any UH availability this week before Thanksgiving. If I don't see you before Thursday, happy Thanksgiving to you, my young, my good friend. To you as well. And to uh, to to Joe Mendez and Tony M. Leonard as well. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Zach Rome as well. For all the folks who support Folks Talking Sports, the Daily Cougar, and the Houston Round Bar Review, happy holidays because it's tis the season now. And just join us tonight, late night. It'll be Less Rage Cougs After Dark with Andy Yanez, Deion Dunlap, me. See if we get Jane to stay up late to join us as well. So we will recap the Cougs Ducks men basketball game, basketball game later this evening on the Houston Round Bar View YouTube channel. So until then, everybody take care. See you later. Peace.